I'm sure mine does. All right. Good evening, everybody, Thanks. and welcome to the Prince George's County Historical Society's June 27th, 2022 History Chat with Franklin Robinson Jr. and John Peter Thompson. They will be discussing preservation and archiving of your family papers and photographs. We will be recording the chat, so please mute your, mute your microphones. Um, and this recording will be posted on our YouTube channel, which can be found on our website, www.pghistory.org. Um, we will be taking questions, so please put your questions in the chat and we will get to as many of your questions at the end of the discussion. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Mr. Robinson. He is an archivist with the Archive Center at the Smithsonian <laughs> National. Uh, I had a. Sorry, muting several people here. Um, uh, he's an archivist at the Archive Center at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. He works on proce a processing team that prepares paper and film collections for long-term preservation and researcher use. He has processed the papers of songwriter Harry Warren, comic Groucho Marx, and Hollywood director George Sidney. He has processed collections dealing with agriculture, LGBTQ, popular culture and the performing arts. He has curated archive center exhibits focusing on the Stonewall 40th anniversary, HIV and AIDS. My apologies, my phone is ringing now. Again, apologies for that, everybody. Um, let's see. Uh, the exhi another exhibit he, he curated was chocolate and many other topics. He has authored many archive center finding aids, as well as he's authored monographs and books on local Maryland history. His latest book is Faith and Tobacco, which he was published in 2015. He is the current chair of the Charles County Historic Preservation Commission. He is the recipient of the Maryland Historical Trust Preservation Service Award. He was appointed to the board of the Maryland Historical Trust in 2016 and currently serves as vice chair. He is a board member of the, member of the Maryland Historic Districts Commission and a board member of the National Episcopal Historians and Archivists. And if that isn't enough, he is also a professional actor, produced playwright, and a playwriting teacher. So thank you, thank you for joining us, Franklin. And now I'll turn it over to John Peter to begin our chat. Well, uh, welcome, Franklin, to our history chat. Thank you. And I just want to know that, uh, let everybody know that Donna and I did not coordinate what our <laughs> work this evening, uh, even though it looks that way. So good uh -huh. to be with everybody. Well, excellent. So um, we're going to talk about uh, preserving family history. And I, I suppose that includes archiving and curating but I want to start with why is it important to um, preserve family history and when should you start doing it? Well, I always say it's never too, too early to start. Uh, and the reason is, is that I always like to tell Ruth that I do this presentation for in person is that each one of us has a unique history and each one of us is unique within our own family groups. So what you produce in the course of your life, whether you think it, it is um, of quote unquote historical value or not, it does reflect who you are and what you do in the world. And um, hopefully people coming after you will have some curiosity about your life. And even if not, um, current historical thought is uh, that you, um, social history is, is kind of what makes history now in the sense that the kind of uh, what we would consider um, just the average person. What is the average person doing on a day-to-day -day basis? What are their thoughts about what is happening in the world today? So um, if, you know, if you keep a diary or journal, um, even emails, and we can talk about that a little bit later, um, all of that will reflect the times that we're living in. And yes, it would be your opinion, but what is history but um, a grouping of opinions and or um, 
a grouping of divergent opinions or thoughts about the times. I mean, look at Samuel Pepys. I mean, we find him fascinating now, but I'm sure that when he was recording that, did he did he really think folks are going to read it or not? You know, but uh, thank goodness he did. And just in what may have seemed mundane to him in the sense of everyday life, uh, certainly informs the whole history of that era for us, as well as, I mean, you can pick any, any set of letters um, as was so elegantly illustrated by Ken Burns in the Civil War, um, think of all uh, those letters that were went back and forth and thankfully so many of them were preserved and are saved and many are accessible to the public historian um, that informs what what your everyday soldier was thinking about on the battlefield um, who was he writing to what uh, was the most important thing in their lives um, it just gives a window into the time and that's why it's important to preserve uh, like I said, personal family history, um, because that is that is the stuff from which history will be written. I I want to um, ask a, a definitional question before I turn you loose on detail. Okay. What's the difference between a curator of a collection and an archivist? <laughs> well, hmm, that's a, that's a very good question, and let me see if I can answer it. Um, Okay, a curator collects objects, 3D objects. I mean, this is, you can argue that archivists collect 2D objects, but that doesn't make them a curator. Um, so in the museum world, uh, curators collect, like I said, 3D objects, and they don't necessarily collect a range of objects or a group of objects. So um, if they're going to, uh, collect from, let's say, a, a potter or something. They may go and collect one or two um, examples that that potter has has thrown to kind of illustrate what his or her work was. Um, but they would not necessarily collect the whole range of every pot that 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 potter made. Now, an archivist, in contrast, really wants the full record. That doesn't mean that they save everything, but they want to really collect uh, and archive the entire paper record. Now they would go through and arrange that into correspondence, photographs, business records, all of that, but the archivist looks at it as a whole, i.e. the whole picture of this potter's world and what he was doing and how much was he paying for the clay, who were some of his clients, all of that's gonna be contained within the paper record, which is not necessarily contained in the curatorial record. Um, so archivists and archivists, the two uh, disciplines, curators tend to be very um, territorial. Um, don't tell my colleagues that. <laughs> Lynn, I see you laughing. I know you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and uh, whereas archivists are, they collect because they want you to use it. Archivists are there to get things ready for you researchers to come in and find that one nugget that you have been missing in your research, whatever you might be researching. So there's, there's kind of a philosophical difference as well in a way, not that curators don't like for you to see their material, but they're not necessarily um, inviting you up to the fifth floor in our, in our building to kind of have coffee and look at, oh, look at my pots. Um, whereas we're open five days a week and archivists are just, you know, hey, look at this and look at this. And oh my gosh, look at this. I should collect this. This speaks to so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. so does that answer your question, John? It, it, it does. And I think we're ready to, to um, what is the word, dive into how you get started with personal history. You, you and I had a pre-discussion about my great-great-grandfathers on the wall behind me. So when it comes to family history, how does one get started? Well, you know, I think, I might not be wrong in saying this, is that probably all of us can think back to that time that we saved that one birthday card, that letter, um, if you're a child, maybe your parents, or when you, we were all children, your parents saved those drawings from your grade school, your report cards. So in some ways we all 
our archivists in a way because we do save things, or at least most of us do, save things that are important to us. And that, that is a very uh, important distinction in the sense of what, what is important to you, you will save it and you want to preserve it. Um, now, then you have to answer why you want to do that, right? But um, so I think, uh, I think you're, I think most, I'd like to say most human beings are kind of knit that way to save things. Um, I mean, there some of us save more than others, same, some of us save far too much more than others. So, uh, but I think it's, I think it's just inherent. And if, like I said, I, I would hope that anybody thinking uh, can think back to that, that first time that they really realized, oh, this is, this is a piece of my history, or this is, wow, this is a letter from my great grandparents when they were courting or, um, and that strikes a chord. And then you're like, oh, well, that needs to be saved. And um, I just wanna, Sharmila, yes, uh, absolutely. Electronic and digital records are part of the documentary record. And um, I would speak a little bit more about those later. Yeah, and I, I think we're going exactly where I want us to go. So I have piles of family papers, for mm -hmm. example, some of which I have not um, <clears throat> preserved correctly. Okay. So they're kind of turning yellow and I know what they say, but nobody else is going to know what they say. And I know there are techniques for paper. Mm -hmm. I haven't thought about how I save emails from family. Um, and I don't even know where to begin on this. So I'm kind of let turn you loose because I know there are different techniques, for instance, the photographs behind me versus paper documents versus things, I guess, uh, cards and so forth. So I, I'm gonna sort of turn you loose because I think there are different techniques for preserving things right. once well, you've uh, realized you wanna do this. Yes, and, and quite frankly, uh, so people don't get scared, it's, it's actually quite, quite easy. Um, so I, let me speak to email for just a second. So the thing is, is that um, I would tell you that when you are going through your family papers or your papers, um, everything does not get the same weighted importance. Um, kind of the rule of thumb is, or I like to tell people when they come visit at the archives and are thinking about donating their papers, I say, okay. I said, if somebody was to come and write a book about you in a hundred years or even 50 years, what would they, what would you want them to have access to? Now, some people, of course, don't want people to have access to anything, which is gonna make a very boring biography, but you would want certainly letters, correspondence, cards, all that sort of thing. Um, and then, you know, we I get into the email situation. Let me answer that question kind of first. So with email, you know, it's correspondence has, has well, correspondence, by default, but not necessarily by design, has mushroomed, right? And not every email is important. But what I tell people is I said, it's a very, I think a very simple way, is that at the beginning of every year, uh, get yourself some asset-free folders, take one folder and you can say emails 2022. That goes above your desk. And any email that comes in and you, you think, oh, wow, that, that really needs to be saved because that really says some information that doesn't need to be lost. Now, I'm thinking more of like the correspondence. I'm not thinking so much business records, right? So let's say if, uh, if you are, if there's something happens in the family and someone shoots you an email and says, whether somebody has been born, somebody passes, um, some landmark uh, thing has happened and you're like, oh, this is really great. I need to, let me, let me save this. So print it out. It's going to be diametrically opposed to what everybody else tells you, but you know that's that's always like I, I say about electronic and digital records. They die quicker than dinosaurs because you have to migrate those all the time. When systems change, they have to be taken to the next system. So if it's important to you, print it out. And I would say for digital for digital photographs, the same thing. I always like to tell people, I said, when you pass, I said, is someone actually gonna sit down and go through those thousands and thousands of photographs that are on your hard drive, right? I don't think so. They're gonna be more concerned with, you know, settling in a state, getting the house ready to, for sale, perhaps, 
or do they even know your password to get into your photographs? So if there's a particular photograph that means something to you, or uh, if you're a photographer, an amateur photographer, and you think, wow, that's, that's kind of a hang on the wall photograph, do yourself a favor, get a decent color printer, print it out, put this in that file. And that way they'd at least have to think twice before they pitch it out. Now, for other things, like you were talking about, John Peter, you want to um, get yourself some basic archival supplies, i.e. folders, boxes, and those are the, the gray boxes. Let's see, I don't have one sitting next to me, or I would show you. And it's, you just take this in small bites. And you want to, in processing, you want to think of how, sh how are these records should be arranged. So in the archives, kind of what we usually do, especially with family papers, we arrange them according to who created them. So let's say you have, um, to use a Maryland name, George Calvert, right? So we have George Calvert's correspondence. We have George Calvert's business records. We have George Calvert's family something or other. Right, so that goes under George Calvert and then it gets a nice span date. But within those, all of those records, you have what we call three series, i.e. correspondence, finance, and family business or, or connections or whatever you might want to call it. Um, and then within those, you would file these materials in those acid-free folders, not to make them too fat. Um, if you wanna get really, uh, really down and dirty, you can file it uh, by, uh, chronologically by date within the folder, or you can do maybe, okay, all of the correspondence from 1625 goes here, all of the 1626 correspondence, and then at least somebody coming after you will know, okay, I want the 1625 correspondence. That is in box five, folder two. Um, let's see, with photographs, uh, just to say if anybody has what they call the, um, I think they were called magic scrapbooks, those ones with those, those nasty gluey things. Yeah, I see Lynn shaking her head. Yeah, I mean, a lot of us did, right? So those, take your photographs out of them as soon as possible, and you want to invest in some archival sleeves, which you can get uh, through. Uh, there are three main purveyors, Hollinger, Metal Edge, and Gaylord, and University Products. Can you talk a little bit about this, th those products? I mean, why are they, what's special about them? What do they do? Sure, they are um, what we would call either acid-free, i.e. they're not made out of uh, acidic wood pulp, which uh, most newspapers of the 20th, late 20th century and into our century are made of that to give you an idea of what that is. Um, or uh, like the photo sleeves are made of um, polypropylene, which means there is no, um, no oil used, no uh, petroleum products used in them because petroleum products and anything that is plastic will off gas eventually. And that affects the photographs or the papers that are stored in them. So you wanna get things that are marked archival. And in fact, if you go into Staples or any Office Depot or whatever, just look on the paper because it'll say right on the list, let's say, you know, uh, you know, plain bond, so-and-so uh, and so-and-so, -and -so, white, you know, archival quality. That's all you need to see. You're good to go. That means it's non-acidic and it will not deteriorate um, under normal conditions, i.e. a fairly constant temperature. Um, and if it's, you know, housed, you know, not underneath the, the coffee pot, but actually in a folder maybe. So, um... I'm on this deterioration theme here, and and you've talked about photographs, and this is very interesting. Let's go back to, I have a lot of papers, including uh, music scores mm. from the early 20th century from my great grandmother, mm -hmm. which are, of course, sort of turning yellow. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do with paper? You just said the paper has acid in it or problems yeah. in it. How do you protect that kind of thing? Well, that can be expensive because if you are going to conserve paper, um, there are processes that do that. But with something like that, the best you can probably do is, like I said, there get some acid-free folders for yourself. And there are 
they make them in all sizes. So they would have sizes for man stores and manuscripts and the appropriate size boxes. And there is also deacidification spray, which um, does not harm the paper. And you just lightly spray and that neutralizes the acid that is currently in the paper. Um, so that's kind of the layman's quick way to do something. Uh, or if it's something that's particularly unique or um, you think needs the next step, you can certainly get a paper conservator and, uh, and then they would give you a price to stabilize that paper and do whatever they need to strengthen it um, and to preserve it. And you can uh, find a conservator, it's called the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works. And um, let's see, uh, simple, uh, web address is conservation uh, yeah, yeah, uh, conservation dash us dot org. So that's conservation dash us dot org, and then you punch in your zip code, and they will bring up uh, a listing of people that are accredited and vetted, and uh, may or may not be able to take on your project. So while we're talking about things somebody might want to save a family history, and you talked about. Uh, I'm back to photographs. What mm -hmm. about those of us who grew up with eight millimeter film? All right, that is actually not as not as um, foreign as you might think because there. Well, first of all, one thing that I that I need to stress is that with photographs and motion pictures, you can get it transferred to digital DVD, whatever the current thing is, but never, never, never get rid of your original. I just remember I was giving this talk one time and, uh, and someone said, oh, my husband just transferred all of our photographs to um, digital and threw away the negatives. And I guess my gasp, <laughs> she goes, oh, that wasn't, I said, no. I said, because if you ever have to go back to get that photograph again, if the cloud blows up or you, your computer goes away, where are you gonna go to get that photograph now? That that your negatives have been destroyed. Hopefully you have a print of it somewhere. But anyway, so that's the first thing is you don't ever wanna do that. Um, but for eight millimeter film, and I think they are still in business, uh, there's two places actually, Color Lab, which is in Rockville. Um, they do an excellent job with film and they know how to treat film in an archival manner. And um, they can get you a digital copy and they can also make sure that your eight millimeter film is preserved properly in a nice film can uh, on a core uh, or Brodsky and Treadway, which is in uh, Boston, Massachusetts, I think. I, we, during the pandemic, everything kind of went to hell in the handbasket. So I haven't uh, had a chance to use them lately. So, but as far as I know, they're, I know they're in Massachusetts. They may be not quite in Boston, so. But both of those firms I can recommend. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it's... Is yeah, it Franklin, where, where do you... So you don't throw out the negatives and you don't throw out the original... Uh, film. Film. How do you store those? You want to store those in a relatively uh, stable environment, i.e. with a low humidity and on the cooler side. So you probably want to have it... Uh, I would say somewhere around 68 degrees, like I said, low humidity. So if you've got um, a place in the house that's good for that, or what I always like to tell people, I said, you know, if you get, if you get things transferred and your material is particularly relevant to a particular uh, portion of the country or uh, a county, you know, reach out to that, reach out to that, uh, that historical society or that state's um, historical society or archives and say, hey, uh, I've got these eight millimeter films of, you know, me growing up in, in Podunk, Missouri. And, uh, you know, my parents were really good about filming birthday parties and all these great social things. Um, would you like those? And nine chances out of 10, they actually may take them, especially if there is a digital copy now and you have um, done the legwork of getting them uh, preserved in a proper way. So they would just, but also vet them to make sure they have the proper storage uh, for these items as well. Um, that's the, a lot of problems with local societies and that sort of thing. They are just, as you all know very well, the money is, is on, you know, is, is very short. So um, some, are, some are amazing and, and are very well endowed and others are, are 
doing as much as they can with what they have. So the other thing to think about that is, um, is that if it comes with money, my guess is that they're gonna be more apt to take it. Uh, someone, I had uh, written a response to somebody and asked Amy and uh, somebody emailed me at the museum and said, you know, I have papers that, uh, that pertain to Pennsylvania and you know, what should I do? And she explained what they were. And I said, well, I said, I would suggest calling the Pennsylvania State Archives and I said, but I said, if you are able to say, I will give you five, $10,000 to process these, that is going to sweeten the pot because archives just don't have a lot of money. But if you can give money in order to support the processing of them, i.e. getting them ready for researchers, they are gonna look a little bit more favorably on taking that donation. And sure enough, she called me back. She says, you were absolutely right. She said, I offered them whatever it was and, and they were able to take that and get it processed. So um, that's a long answer to your question, John Peter. I, hopefully I answered it. No, and I, I have one more. So in, my, in the 90s, I did a little bit of traveling. I transferred uh, photographs to CDs. In the back of my mind, I'm wondering how long my CDs will be accessible, since I think a lot of computers that I run into don't seem to have a CD player thingy bob anymore. That's right. And in fact, the new generation of Macs don't even have a port for your flash drive. So, so there's 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 the illustration that I was just talking about. It's you know everybody raced to digitize everything, and um, depending on what kind of format you've got, if you haven't migrated it, uh, you're going to have to do it again. But to answer your question, um, digital things, i.e., CDs, uh, videotape, all of that uh, will delaminate in time, and the kind of standard is 25 years. So even, you know, your old time shellacs are much more stable than your current CD. Um, so, so. Well, I'm probably in trouble then. <laughs> yeah, well. Uh, I think maybe. these CDs are about 25 years. But hopefully you did not throw out those originals, did you? <laughs> Um, um, well, I, 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 I need another question. Somebody from the audience <laughs> asked a question. I seem to have been caught here. So, so I would um, say, while we're on that subject, though, is about videotape, is that um, certainly in I, John Peters and my generation and, and uh, probably a few others, that was home movies were the thing, right? So thank goodness, because that's actually more stable than videotape. I dare say, if you have, if you grew up in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, or had children then and did the whole videotape thing. If you went back and looked at them, they're probably gone into your, your three basic colors of, of blue, green, and red. Um, but if they haven't, I, I say get to, get to a digitizer uh, sooner rather than later because they, they are definitely going to start delaminating. So. One of the things that um, when I've come across some version of this conversation it's usually somebody doing genealogy. How, mm -hmm. how does what we're talking about and genealogical research kind of go together? Mm -hmm. Are they the same thing? Are they part of something bigger? Um, well, I think they're, they're certainly part of the same thing, but also part of something bigger in that, of course, for most of us, uh, initially, genealogy is, is a, is a is a bunch of names and dates, right? I mean, that's how we start. You know, here I am, here's my parents, and then you go back as far as you can go, and then you start digging. And that's all really great. That gets you that foundation. But if you get to a certain point, then what informs their lives better than if you can find a diary, some letters, if they were a public figure, you know, there's all of that material perhaps in the public record. Um, you know, if they, if, you know, the fact of the matter, if they were landed, they're going to show up. Um, so all of this, all of that archival stuff plays into, um, I think, fleshing out their lives. And even if there's not particularly um, anything that relates to them personally, what better informs kind of the era than in which they live? If you can find somebody's diary in that area or in that state, perhaps, that can kind of say, you know, what, what was life like back then? What, what, um, 
what what things you know were happening or what did people comment on there was this really great um diary that came into the archive center and we call it the maryland farm diary um and i forgot the family that kept it but in reading it when i was processing it he talks about an earthquake and i'm like and sure enough there was an earthquake in maryland like in the i want to say it's the 1880s but it was not it was not as huge as the of course the one we had in what 2012 or whenever that was but there was you know so but I never knew, and I don't think that it's particularly general knowledge, but it was really interesting to hear. It was so, they felt it so much that he had to, re he recorded it in the diary. Oh, I think, Franklin, we are losing your audio there. Are we? Oh, oh there you're back. Okay. okay. I was going right. to say, no, you're not. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, okay, I was losing your audio. Okay, so, um, so, so things like that, are, I mean, it's, it's, you know, and as we all know, genealogy is the best detective novel ever. So you're always searching um, and things will turn up in the most unlikely of places um, and perhaps in records that you don't necessarily think, you know, oh, there's nothing there. But if they've been processed properly and there's a decent finding aid, you might think, oh, wow, they lived in the same area and may, there may be, be. So, you know, they might have mentioned your, your relatives or, uh, or like I said, an institution that they were affiliated with or, uh, you know, lodges, churches. A lot of people forget that, um, especially with the Roman Catholic and the Episcopal Church, I can't speak much to the Methodist. I know that they kept records, but um, they were such an uh, evangelical religion in the sense of, i.e., going out into the wilderness, uh, they're not necessarily as good as particularly Episcopalian records or even Roman Catholic. Roman Catholics are very protective of their records. There's, um, I, they, they don't necessarily open them immediately uh, on request. Episcopalians are pretty out there. I mean, if you know which parish your people attended, they'll pretty much let you, let you know uh, what if there was baptisms, marriages, if they sat on the vestry. Uh, so there's all those types of records uh, that I think people tend to overlook because they're just looking for the standard marriage certificate, birth certificate, uh, you know, wills and that sort of thing. So I'm going to assume that if you have a cousin and you hear the cousins cleaning the attic out and you arrive and see all kinds of documents going into a dumpster, you should immediately claim the dumpster. That's ex yes, yeah, yep. Yeah, that's you should you, you should you should immediately claim the dumpster and tell them no more stuff goes in the dumpster. It goes in the trunk of my car. If you don't that's want right. it and you're throwing it out, um, I will come get it. Um, well, of course, we all I think we all probably know the story of the Calvert papers being thrown into the gravel pit over at Kipling Hall, right? And thankfully, uh, from what I understand, a butler there knew exactly where to tell the Maryland Historical Society to dig. And that's how we have the Calvert Papers at the Maryland Historical Society, um, is those were actually thrown out of the house. And Lynn, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but they were buried. And then uh, I think a team from the Maryland Historical Society went over and was able to, to get them and to dig them up and save what they could. So this, this goes, we're talking now a little bit about research outside of your own um, collection of papers within your house. But I've also found going through land records and title records, uh, you can learn certain things about people and your family from that kind of record. And it goes without saying, hopefully you don't have family members that wound up in various courts, but court documents can be very interesting also. Right. Well, I like to tell my, the people that I do, I said, you know, none of us are saints. Um, so, and, and my guess is that probably none of us descend from saints. Uh, and that to me makes a more interesting historical record. So, uh, you know, you never know what you might find. And, and yes, it may be something that uh, is not necessarily the most proudest thing you would want to point to, but at least it informs uh, you as to what that person was like, or maybe what what was their life like or what were they perhaps like? Because um, I think we all tend to maybe, um, you know, we, we like to think the best of people and certainly we like to think the best of our ancestors. So I've uh, done a, a shotgun approach here and sort of thinking about all the papers and documents that I may or may not still have. What, 
what should I have asked you given this, this topic? Hmm. Oh, you mean to tell me I actually asked the right well, question? Yeah, I think you pretty much did because um, we did touch on exactly what, what can laymen do to preserve the papers that they feel are important or that they want to preserve for their family. I guess the, the one thing that maybe we, we didn't necessarily touch on in a primary way, but I think maybe I danced around it on a few things is, um, you know, at some point uh, you, you have to think about what are you doing with your stuff? Uh, where is it gonna go once your eyes are closed? I mean, trust me, we're all gonna be worm food one of these days, right? So there's no time like the present then to say, you know, gosh, you know, especially, you know, you know, if you if you descend from the great and good, that's awesome. And hopefully you have lots of great papers. But if there are just a few things in your family that are very important to you, you know, make sure that you know what's going to happen when your eyes close, i.e. it's either in your will or um, perhaps you have uh, made copies and then donated those materials to, like I was saying, either historical society or in archives. Um, and that way, you know that they're safely there. Um, or you designate one person, whether it be a relative or a friend to say, okay, this is where these materials go. And here it is in writing. I cannot stress that enough because um, everything else is hearsay. If somebody comes in and says, oh, well, Joan said that these were to go to the X, Y, Z. And, and somebody says, well, no, that's no, I'm taking those. I'm the daughter and too bad, so sad. So uh, there's nothing like a good will or a good uh, notarized document if you're if you're not going to give it up early to make sure that it does go to the right place. Um, I don't. I, I'm bouncing again. So mm -hmm. we've talked about family correspondence. We uh, pictures. You know, family defining a person. But you've mentioned a couple times sort of business financial documents. Um, how about tax returns? Right, okay, so tax returns are good in the sense that it is a photograph of the year before. So that, that if, if you're not gonna save anything else, I would say save your tax returns because it kind of shows where's the income coming from, how much are they making, what are the expenses? So it does give kind of, a, hopefully a truthful, truthful picture of, the year before. Um, the other thing to think about is if, if you're thinking about um, IE business records for a business and or an organization, um, meeting minutes are very important, uh, year in financial statements. Uh, let's say if you have an annual meeting, uh, that, that is always a great thing to save. You don't necessarily have to save every check stub and every bank statement. Uh, you just want to be able to uh, give the researcher an idea of, oh, uh, you know, 1930 was a bad year because, you know, you've got whatever documents might, you know, from, certainly from the, if you were on the stock exchange or even a farmer or someone in, uh, in, in other circumstances, tax bills, that sort of thing that would tell a story of, 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 of the financial side of things, i.e., uh, with through these documents and you are you are dating yourself because I get to ask the following question what's a check stub <laughs> oh <laughs> well uh, I, I would no I would show you if I could find my checkbook so because uh, I'm sorry I, I could I couldn't resist that's okay yeah check stubs and um and um gosh what else would be you know, register receipts or anything like that. Well, and that brings up another point that we have not touched on. I always like to say, you know, think about um, how much of our lives now are on are digital, i.e. on an iPod, iPhone, um, you know, with paying your bill, you know, sending texts back and forth, all of that. So 25, 50 years from now, when historians go back to see like what was going on, where, where are those records? Because those aren't, those don't migrate. Nobody's saving that stuff. So- I thought you know, that whatever you do on the internet is forever. What, <laughs> that's what they tell you. But of course, uh, even that I don't think, I don't think is true because um, that means that you have to have a way to IE look at it. And if I know I'm really gonna date myself now, you remember the floppies that were like 12 by 12? I have did, some. Yeah, and then six by six, and then smaller flash drive, and now it's the cloud. 
how many machines are around that, that can still read those 12 by 12s? None yeah, that no, I and I, I know this from other examples from within the US government with um, magnetic tapes from satellites and right. then they threw out the old uh, reel to reel computers. So we saved the tapes. And right. I suppose there's a way to go read the data from the 60s, but um, we forgot to save the computer that, or the reel to reel thing that read those magnetic tapes. Um, and, and let me, and Lynn brought up a very good point because, and I was thinking about that, we must have been on the same wavelength, is, is for photographs and all that stuff, be sure you identify the people or the place where they are. And I don't mean Grandma Joe, because no one's gonna know who Grandma Joe is two generations, not maybe even one generation down the road, <clears throat> you want to say, you know, Grandma Josephine Baker Knee Smith. And this is at so-and-so Prince George's County, Maryland, 1929. So I, I know that sounds like a lot, but you can buy um, archival pens through one of those purveyors that I mentioned. And they actually, you want to, when you mark on the back of a photograph, you want to go at the top edge. You do not want to go across the middle because in case, God forbid, that thing turns out not to be archival, but most of them, they're not going to lie to you. Uh, it will not bleed through the photograph. But yes, there are marking pens uh, that come in all colors and um, just keep them around. And you know, when you print out those photographs, just mark on the back. I know it's a pain in the behind, but trust me, someone will really appreciate you um, down the road. And that, that is, thank you, Lynn and, and Franklin, because I believe that the Historical Society, which is busy digitizing and uploading to Digital Maryland photographs, at least the ones we know what it is, we have boxes of photographs in which it's a, gee, this is interesting. Is it even Maryland? Right, right. Because we have no idea what we're looking at, even though it's interesting. <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly. Um, and I suppose this goes when you're using digital photography, you should find a way. Now I'm probably dating myself. If it doesn't automatically give a GPS and, and a GPS will tell us when and where, but it won't right. tell us who right, or what. Well, you know what, yet again, you can do, um, at least I know at the museum, what we do with ours is there's there's a thing called metadata that you can plug in somewhere. And Lord knows I am not a computer person, but yet again, it's, it's the whole idea of that's something that would have to be migrated. So I would say if you, you find to go ahead and do that, but, but yet again, print out that thing and, and write on the back who it is, especially if it's um, an older photograph um, that may be um, that you're not conserving or is, is kind of at risk of, of deteriorating, so. All right, so I think you've answered my generic questions. <laughs> and, and is anybody left listening or has everybody said, wow, this is too much, too much yep, to the do? The audience is still there, it's still here. Oh, excellent. Um, and I've asked you what I should have asked you but you've given us some resources for tools and we've touched on resources for information. Maybe we can spend a little time on the resources for information. And I suppose this is where genealogy sort of comes, hand, comes in handy, but you've talked about historical societies. What other kind of resources might a person turn to mm -hmm. as they organize and document family history. Sure, state archives, and they run the gamut. We have our own wonderful Maryland State Archives. Um, that's, that should always be a stop. If your state has a historical society, um, there's certainly the county historical society. Um, now, and then you branch out to, I have found some of the most fascinating th things at the Episcopal Archives in Baltimore, uh, because the before the Diocese of Washington was created in 1895, everything was in Baltimore and through the Diocese of Maryland. So priests would correspond with the bishop and they would certainly talk about their parishioners. Um, and so if you are from Maryland and happen to be an Episcopalian, uh, you might be lucky. There may be something in some of those um, letters and correspondence and reports were done annually from the parish and that tells number of baptisms, confirmations and that sort of thing. Um, certainly for um, underserved populations, um, 
native peoples, it's very difficult, of course, um, but uh, we have the Piscataway Kanoi, uh, the tribal chief Francis Gray, uh, always able to are willing to try to answer as many questions as he can. Um, for African American records, um, things are getting better. There's the Maryland State Archives did a wonderful project with documenting um, records that they have within their collections, as well as um, Prince George's County, and I think it's Dorchester, I can't remember, there's only two counties that actually have what were called the slave statistics that were done in 1868, which lists the planter's name and the enslaved that they had, first and last names. Those are, those are amazingly rich. And like I said, if you're lucky enough to be from Prince George's County, you might be able to find um, information there. Um, and National Archives, of course. Um, and I would, I would dare say anything that you find on the net, be sure that you, you vet it. You know, any good archivist and or historian is going to tell you the trail that they followed to get the information that they have. So there will, therefore there should be footnotes, bibliography, something to say, okay, I found this birth date here. And this is where you can go look at it as well. Um, because you really need to follow that trail because not everybody is as meticulous as I know we all are on this call. So, um, yeah. And um, so you brought up, you've brought up an interesting thing as resources. Is it worth spending time uh, writing down oral history within the family? Oh, absolutely. That's, that's in some ways, that's maybe the first thing you should do. If you have older family members that are around, um, seriously, sit down with them. I mean, you, you know, whether it be with pencil and paper or if you want to have a recording device and just ask them, say, you know, you know, tell me about when you grew up, you know, what, you know, how, what was that like? And, you know, because eventually I would hope that they would mention, you know, and then grandma, well, who was grandma? Who was she? What was her maiden name? You know, sure, absolutely. Ask all these things and then transcribe it, um, you know, get it down on paper so you can share that with somebody else very easily. But absolutely, oral histories are very important. I mean, we, we, we have really um, upped our collecting of oral histories at the museum. And I know the Library of Congress is, is a great one to be collecting them as well. So very important documents. And they also will provide clues and a lot of myth. Uh, so that's why I would say it's really great to get those down because it's like the telephone game. Your grandma may tell you this story, but then if you start researching it, you'll find that kernel of truth, but the thing that has morphed around it, maybe not so much. So, yeah. And again, the oral history, you need to document who, who you were talking to, right. where, when. It's all those wonderful questions that need yeah. to go with right. um, the project. Right. And okay. Sharmila so, actually points out, I just want to say this for the group who's not looking at the chat, is that you can add metadata to photographs. Um, it's embedded within the image. So thank you, Sharmila. Uh, okay. Right, yes, yes. You also to get permissions for oral histories. And those are available if you go online and just look for a release form is what they would be called for oral histories. Um, you want to get one of those um, signed by the whoever you're interviewing at the time. Oh, that's interesting. No, nobody, I didn't sign a release form when I was about five or six to be in the family videos. Well, you know, or whatever they they weren't videos, the Kodak machine. <laughs> right, the, the eight millimeters, yeah. Um, well, you know, that that is an, an eternal quandary in the museum world because uh, as we collect these materials and for family films and that sort of thing, of course, nobody asks you, you know, there's no releases and that sort of thing. Uh, yes, Sharmila, yet again, if you donate the oral history, the institution may have problems providing access. Yes, uh, with a museum is that as long as it is used for scholarly purposes, and that sort of thing, then we can provide. And then it's up to the researcher. If they're taking that into a book that they're working, they have to go to uh, find out who has the rights and ask them permission. I think our audience is making my life easier. This <laughs> might be a good time. Uh, more questions, please, while I try to think of riveting questions like, what is a check stub? That's right. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to point out that the county also has a, the African American Historical and Genealogical oh. Society, or I flipped genealogical and historical, I don't remember. Um, but they're, they're also a great resource for county, county 
residents or or trying to trace history here in the county as well. Stacy, you're so right. I mean, if if everybody that we called aunt was actually an aunt, my, my family would have been huge. They were mostly uh, second cousins that were much older than we were. Good point. Uh, Stacy says, uh, nice for oral family histories too, as you find out that Aunt Agnes was actually a dear family friend and not a real aunt. That is very true. Yeah. That, that's correct. When I was growing up here in Prince George's County, friends of my grandparents were assigned what I called an honorific title of right. aunt and uncle. Right. No relative, but I was instructed on penalty of severe pain. This is Aunt Sally and Uncle Chick to you <laughs> right. uh, forever. Right. That's right. So um, just so a few other things that I always bring out is, um, you know, if you're lucky enough to have materials, don't be stingy with them. Share them with family members if they're so interested, um, because Lord knows if you have a fire or some sort of weather event, you might be happy that you shared all that stuff with somebody else that you can get a copy back. Um, there are, if you're framing something for display, uh, go the extra mile and get some UV glass or museum framing. Um, I usually, uh, not, not that I'm advertising, but frame of mine on 8th Street near the barracks. They, they do all my framing and they know exactly. You walk in, you say you want a UV glass and they can ask, do you want glare or non-glare? Do you want museum housing? Do you, so they know, they know the drill. Um, let's see, identification, we did that. Uh, Oh, well, the one, the first point that I always bring up is first, do no harm. If you don't know what to do, then put it aside and get a professional or ask, an, ask a professional. Um, don't, don't get out the uh, scotch tape and the paper clips. Um, any other questions? <laughs> I knew that would get you, John Peter. Was a... <laughs> yeah, the scotch tape. <laughs> yeah. Well, as we're and doing our- somebody. I was just gonna say, as we're doing our photo um, scanning right now, we're finding uh, staples where people have Ooh. stapled the um, description of what the photo is um, to the picture. So yeah. don't do that either. <laughs> and there's these, there's these great things called, um, oh man, I don't have one here. We call them binder boxes, but what it is is basically a notebook and it's, a, it's, a, it's an acid-free, binder box and you can actually you put your photographs in your nice archival sleeves put that in there and it's in an archival box and then you can put a nice label on the the outside you know robinson family you know at the farm um and then that way it's in, it's in as best a housing as we would do at the museum and at least uh like i said before it gets pitched out um somebody actually has to think twice about saying oh gosh this is this is really done well do we really want to throw this out no so Franklin, well, you meant that, that is. Sorry. I'm oh, sorry. So I was gonna say, Franklin, before we got started, you mentioned you had a list that you'd be willing to mm -hmm. share. Mm -hmm. So if you send that to me, I will go ahead and I'll post it not only on our website, but I can also put it in our next newsletter. So uh, oh, if you don't good. mind. Yeah. Very good. No, not at all. Not at all. Happy to. Um, anything else, anybody? Uh, uh, Madam moderator, how many, where are we in the time? Uh, we have six minutes, so go for it. Oh, I, for, I forgot my um, quick, quick, quick witted quip. <laughs> Say that fast, it, it'll come back to me. Surely there's another question to get us to the end. Otherwise, Franklin and I will compare chair of preservation commission right. notes and really, <laughs> set your hair upright and on fire not at the moment there aren't any other questions um let's see well, i i remember i remember what i was going to say unless somebody has a question nope go for it so as a researcher i remember going through uh family papers and i distinctly remember seeing what was well it it looked like scrap paper mm. and I almost didn't look on the back mm -hmm. and it, it, it wasn't the printed front, which was sort of scrap paper. It was what was on the back that was important to that particular family history where yeah. the, the, the person I was researching had written 
very personal notes mm. that helped explain to me his thinking in life. But I almost um, went right past that piece of paper because of who, who wants to know the water weight legislation for barrels of olive oil or whatever it was. And right. It was well, what was on back. Right. Well, and you know, we have to remember that for most of us, I think, and for all of us, probably, if you go back far enough, especially to the Great Depression, people, I mean, paper was expensive. So you didn't just, you know, Lord knows we got paper now, you know, you can just a sheet, you know, throw it out. But they would they would use every part of that. And and I know in my family, there are, let's say there's there's quote unquote journals or diaries that the pre-printed ones that'll say 1926, but really it's for 1933 because they didn't get around to using that old journal until 1933. And they're like, oh, well, we haven't written in this one yet. So let's do that. So, and then they would just change the proper dates at the top, you know, but they, they a lot of that generation did not throw anything out because you might be able to use it or, you know, you just couldn't afford to get uh, another one or why why buy a new one we got this this blank one here from 1926 why not use that so yeah well i found family All right last chance for a question i've actually found some family history of my own on back of recipes yes yes handwritten recipes yeah oh recipes are a good thing to save yeah. also food ways yep yeah that's absolutely in fact um yeah, I've got some 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 wonderful sweet wine recipes from Calvert County that were my paternal grandmother's that she would have learned from her mother. So they probably would go back to the 1850s. So anybody wants to know how to make parsnip wine or dandelion <laughs> wine, you just let me know. Sure. I mean, we do we do have a comment in the chat from Alyssa Bros where she says, thank you so much for your time and nuggets of knowledge this evening. So nice to see you both, even if it is in the virtual world. <laughs> thank you, Melissa. Uh, Stacy also says, thank you. This was great. Appreciate the information. Thanks, Stacy. So, yeah. Um, trying to think of what, what else to leave you with. But, um, do not encapsulate. Don't get those nasty little things that you peel apart and then you put your driver's license in. No, that's not good. Don't do that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I, Franklin is almost easy to get a hold of. You just go to a uh, Charles County Preservation <laughs> meeting and he'll probably be there. And then you can ask him all kinds of questions if he doesn't rule you out of order. Right. Or I'm even, let me see, I'll put my, hold on. I'll put my email Ma in the chat. Uh, I'll reach out to, the, to us and we're all happy to share it there as we well. Are. Uh, so there's, yes, and that's my work email, and I seriously, I don't mind taking questions. And um, speaking of research, uh, even at the museum and our archives, who knows, you may find something. Uh, it, and the search engine across all of the museums, libraries, and archives is SOVA, S-O-V-A dot S-I dot E-D-U. Uh, if you're, let's say, if your ancestor donated a shrew to the Natural History Museum, that might come up. And you laugh because I actually found that out. There was <laughs> not my ancestor, but somebody that I was researching and I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. So, um, so yeah, you never know what you might turn up. And then we also have quite a lot of corporate records as well. So uh, Western Union, if anybody's connected with Western Union, we have phew, lot, many cubic feet of Western Union records, so yeah. Not telegrams, but the, the corporate records. Okay. Well, thank you, Franklin. Definitely appreciate your time. Um, and I'd like to also thank everybody for joining us this evening. And we always appreciate your participation. If you're not already a society member, consider becoming one and making a donate or making a donation, which can be done through our website, www.pghistory.org. You know, things like our history chats, we can do them for free because of membership support. So we greatly appreciate that. Um, September 15th is the 70th anniversary of the Historical Society. And we have, we're working on plans um, for our various events for our 70th year. So hopefully you can join us for some of them. Um, our first one will actually be in September and we're going to have our um, Prince of a County reception again, where we get to um, invite our members to a uh, historic house here in the county. So 
um, for members, you'll be getting your invitation sometime in August to, to help join us. Um, our next history chat will be July 25th. Um, it's entitled At Home with History. And one of our board members, Jack Thompson, will be having will be having a conversation with him at his house down in Nottingham. And so we'll learn about some Nottingham history. And, and uh, I think he's going to um, walk around his historic house down in Nottingham. So I hope you can join us. So um, thank you again, everybody, for joining us. And good night.